Alright, good. <clears throat> Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahavijan Karava Vahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastuma Vitvi Shavahai Om Shanti 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 Chaitanyam Sarvagam Sarvam Sarvaguhakuhashayam Yat Sarva Vishayatitam As my Sarva Vide Namaha Om Very good So there we go. Welcome to you all. And also uh, welcome to the many students who are regularly watching these classes, attending these classes, I should say, online. Um, we continue today with our study of Upadesha Sahasri. We just began chapter 16 in the prior class, and we return to a familiar but extremely important topic. And when I say extremely important, it's because it addresses directly the problem of suffering. The topic, as you might remember from our last class, was identification. To the extent that you identify with your body and mind, you suffer. To the extent that you identify with your house and car, you will suffer <laughs> to the extent that you identify with your roles in life, your job, your career. You will suffer to the extent that you identify with your grown children. <laughs> you suffer. So the focus of Vedanta is to address the problem of suffering by shifting your identification from... and. I'm, I've been stressing that because so many people, teachers and books often say, destroying, destroy this identification. And somehow that's not a very accurate way of describing the psychology of what happens. What happens in our mind is usually not some kind of radical destruction, but usually some kind of gradual shift. That's what we're engaged in, shifting our identification away from the body and mind and all these externals to the truth of who you are as Satchirananda Atma, unborn, uncreated consciousness. Okay, with that brief introduction, we'll pick up the thread with verse 8. Shiro dukkarin atmanam, Shiro dukkarin atmanam, Dukyasmiti hi pashyati, Dukyasmiti hi pashyati, Drashtanyo dukino drashyat, Drashtanyo dukino drashyat, Drashtritvachana dukyasau, Shankara has a way of using very few words to convey things of such great significance. So one who, pashyati in the second line, one who sees, one who sees, first line, atmanam, oneself. One who sees oneself, how? As shiro, Shiras is his head. Shiras dukkha is pain in the head. We talked about that last week. Headache. So don't think that headaches are any kind of modern phenomenon. We know at least uh, 1,200 years ago, Shankara and his disciples must have suffered from headaches. So, so shiro dukkha dina. So when you... When you pashyati, consider your atmanam, consider yourself as one who has a headache or anything else. You have a head. Hmm. If you have a head, you can have a headache. If you don't have a head, 
But I'm being serious. You don't have a head. Consciousness has a head, arms, feet. This is the problem of identification. And the fact that you laughed at my statement a few moments ago shows how deep that identification goes. Of course I have a head. Consciousness doesn't have a head. Doesn't get headaches. But when you consider yourself to be one who has a head, then definitely you're subject to headaches. And therefore, in the second line, dukhi asmi iti. You come to the conclusion, asmi, I am dukhi. I am one who suffers. I suffer. Notice this conclusion. I'll ask you a, a, a rhetorical question. Is the conclusion, I suffer, is that conclusion due to the headache or due to the conclusion that I have a head? This is Vedanta. You suffer not due to the headache. You suffer due to your conclusion that this is my head. It's pounding like anything, and I won't be okay until and unless that pounding goes away. You have now made your contentment contingent upon something over which you have little control, and that's a formula for misery. I mentioned to someone the other day, I'm an expert in misery. <laughs> when I was young, even into my, well into my adulthood, I created so much misery and suffering for myself in this manner and in so many other manners. So being, I speak from the standpoint of being an expert in misery, and I'm telling you, the problem is not the headache. The problem is identification of yourself as being one who has a head. Shankar explains this. In the second half, he says, Drashta, the observer of the head, the observer of the headache. Same, same thing, right? You're the observer of the head, you're obs the observer of the throbbing that goes on inside. He says that Drashta, the observer, is Anyaha Dukinaha is separate from the sufferer. The observer is different than the sufferer. Who is the sufferer? The sufferer is the one who has made that wrong conclusion. Who is the observer? The one who knows you've made a wrong conclusion. <laughs> the consciousness that illumines all the activities in your mind, that unchanging consciousness. So the observer is other than the sufferer. Sufferer, be, Is that a word in English even? I don't know. I think so, yeah. So the, uh, the, uh, the observer is different than the sufferer, drishyat. Huh? Yeah, drishyat. Because the sufferer is observed. You observe yourself, so you, know how, you know what it feels like to have a headache. Interesting. When you say dukhi aham, probably you wouldn't say it in Sanskrit. <laughs> you would probably say it to yourself in English. I have a headache. When you say I have a headache, or in Sanskrit dukhi aham, when you say that, do you know that you've said it mentally? When you say, I have a headache, and you're talking to yourself, we have this inner chatter, this self-talk it's called. So when you say to yourself, I have a headache, do you know that you've said to yourself that you have a headache? Of course. Huh. The sufferer, the one who says, I have a headache, is known to the observer, pure consciousness. So to whom does the suffering belong? Drishtatvacha na dukhi 
sau drashtratva, sorry, drashtratva cha na dukhi sau, sau, that one, that consciousness which reveals even the conclusion that I have a headache, that consciousness is, is na dukhi, it is not the sufferer because drashtratva, it is the observer. The observer, and here we go to one of our fundamental teachings, the observer is not affected by the observed. So many times we use that familiar metaphor of the sun shining and revealing things, a metaphor used to show how your consciousness reveals activities in your mind. Sun is not affected by what it shines upon in the same way consciousness is not affected by what it reveals in your mind. So even though, and this is going to be explained further in the next verse, so I won't talk about it much more here, except to say that consciousness remains utterly unaffected by whatever happens in your mind. Lately I've been used, I've, in, in classes, you know, we talk about the same subject matter again and again. I find sometimes my focus shifting slightly from year to year. Lately I've been focused on the idea that consciousness is a fundamental reality. It's the truth of who you are, it's the truth of every sentient being fundamental realities don't just change what, what an American expression, willy-nilly, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> fundamental realities like the law of gravity doesn't just change, like the law of cause and effect doesn't just change. Consciousness is such a fundamental reality, it doesn't just change. So Shankara amplifies this in the next verse. Let's see that. Dukhisya dukhya hammanat Dukhisya dukhya hammanat Dukhi no darshana nava Dukhi no darshana nava Samhatengari bhir drashta Samhater Gipir drashta dukhi dukasya naivasaha dukhi dukasya naivasaha dukhi syat you become a sufferer why dukhi aham manat how he makes it absolutely clear Due to your conclusion, I suffer. Your conclusion is the source of suffering. D some of you may know a little bit about behavior, uh, not uh, cognitive psychology. One of the main principles of cognitive psychology is you suffer because of wrong conclusions you've made. You know, the typical example is no one loves me. Right? Typical thing, somebody comes to the counsel, the therapist, psychologist, no one loves me. It's a conclusion, obviously, it's a wrong conclusion, no matter how obnoxious you are, there must be a few people out there in the world who can tolerate you. So it's a wrong conclusion. No one loves me. But it's a wrong conclusion that makes you suffer. And the role of cognitive therapy is to address these wrong conclusions. Does that sound a little bit like Advaita Vedanta? Sure does to me. They have a parallel strategy, let us say. Both cognitive Vedanta, cognitive Vedanta, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> I'm already mixing them up. Cognitive psychology and Advaita Vedanta both begin by by asserting that you suffer because of your wrong conclusions, and then both proceed to remove those wrong conclusions. So I find a parallel betwe between the two. By the way, cognitive behavioral therapy is the therapy of choice, 
nowadays. There were many other through history, starting with Freudian uh, psychotherapy and all of this stuff. You know, so all of that is now considered archaic, and the modern uh, therapy of choice is cognitive behavioral therapy. From my little, from my few words, you can see the power of that of that approach. <coughs> so, first line, Shankara says, "You suffer." because of your wrong conclusion, nava in the second line, but you don't but uh, you don't suffer darshanat dukinaha, dukinaha darshanat. By the way, you know that when I recite these words, I'm breaking the sandhis, the grammatical changes. So what I recite may look slightly different from what you're reading. It's because I'm, I'm using some grammatical rules here to separate the words. So, dukinaha darshanat. Because, he says, nava, you do not suffer because you observe the sufferer. <laughs> you suffer because of your conclusion, I suffer. You do not suffer merely because you observe the suffering merely because you observe the sufferer. Let me, let me, let's make that very clear. Right now there are yeah, it's hundreds of thousands, millions, few millions of, of people, children, families, women in Gaza suffering immensely. I won't get it, we won't get into the politics, but you can't deny they are suffering immensely. Knowing their suffering, how do you feel? Hmm? We're in a comfortable room, having an interesting conversation. There's not much suffering. Of course, we all have some compassion. And if we think about it for a while, if I go on talking about it for a while, chances are you will feel some sense of sadness for those many people who are suffering. But if we move on to the next topic, that's <laughs> that suffering is gone. The point is, is that merely observing suffering doesn't make you suffer. That's the point. You know, setting compassion aside, merely observing the suffering. So what is the message here? Merely observing your head pounding like anything is not the source of suffering. Again, observation doesn't lead to suffering. The observer is unaffected by the observed. Here Shankara makes that point a little differently in the uh, second half here. He says, some uh, dr end of the third line, drashta, the observer. The observer who is samhate angadi bihi. The observer who is samhate in the presence, connected to Angadi bihi, that which has angas. What are angas? Limbs. So you got arms, legs, even the head is considered a limb, uh, at least in, in Vedanta. So you have these various appendages and you find yourself associated with this thing, this body, which has all these, these appendages. But your mere association with this body, with its appendages, dukhi dukasya naiva saha, saha drashta, the observer, naiva dukhi, does not become a sufferer, dukasya, of suffering. Huh. Simply put, Atma doesn't get headaches. That's all he's saying. Atma does, Atma is unchanging. Unchanging consciousness can't get headaches. Unchanging consciousness doesn't need Tylenol, ever. <laughs> now, this is not denying the fact that our bodies require some medications and care. Fine, we, take, we do what we need to do to take care of our bodies. But recognizing that unchanging consciousness is utterly unaffected by the problems of our body and mind in spite, and the point of the second half, in spite of its proximity, samhate, in spite of being stuck 
as it were, along with everything, the metaphor we've used so many times is in the proximity to the orange cloth, this clear crystal appears orange. Did the clear crystal become orange? Of course not. It is an artifact. It is a, an illusion, optical illusion, as it were, due to the proximity of the orange cloth. The orangeness belongs to the cloth, not to the crystal. The headache belongs to the head and not the observer. It's that simple. Um, of course, that simple conceptually, but this has to go in and that's why we keep, that's why we and Shankara himself, we keep talking about it again and again. Have you noticed this topic comes up again and again and again? For an important reason. You know that repetition, especially in scriptures, repetition is considered a huge defect. Then why is this repetition going on? You figured it out. It's absolutely necessary. It doesn't go in just like that. It takes time to reflect on it and hearing it again and again and again is part of that practice. And that's what our whole, that's what our programs here are about. That's what my teaching is about. That's what your attending classes is about. We have to hear this stuff again and again. We have to, I like this language, we have to be immersed in these teachings for a length of time to support this inner transition, this inner shift of identification. The shift takes place, but it takes place gradually to support that gradual shift. This constant immersion is necessary. Okay, now before the next verse, so we're now on verse 9. Next is verse 17. So what happened to those verses? So in the introduction to this chapter, I said the chapters are getting longer and remember verse uh, chapter 18, I think is 230 verses. So they're getting quite long. And more importantly, the chapters are including very technical discussions. And what I've chopped out here, so to speak, is a very technical discussion about Vijnanavada Buddhism. So first of all, if you don't know what is Vijnanavada, then that discussion <laughs> won't, won't be very valuable. But just to give you some insight, so here, the Vijnanavadis, this particular school of Buddhism, you know that all schools of Buddhism reject Satchitananda Atma. They reject consciousness as being the true self. There are four major schools of Buddhism. All four reject the existence of a consciousness independent of body and mind. They accept the sense of self. Still, there is still a self. We would call it a hankara. They use words like skanda and all of this. Uh, we won't get into it. But here's, here's the point. And this is what Shankara goes into. He's, he says, according to these Buddhists, since they don't accept the existence of Atma, they posit that the Buddhi is the one who suffers, the Buddhi is the one who knows the suffering. So the Buddhi is both the observer and the observed. This is Buddhist philosophy, this is not not our philosophy. And then Shankara takes that theory and applies it to Atma. <laughs> he says, well, if Buddhi could be the observer and the observed, is it possible for Atma to be the observer and observed? Then he pulls out some fancy logic to show that one, one thing can either be a subject or object. It cannot simultaneously be both. And he ends up with a metaphor, the sun doesn't illumine itself, the sun shines. 
You see the sun not because it's illumining itself, you see the sun because it's shining by nature. So Shankara does this in a, you can see the number of verses I've skipped, in a fairly complicated way, quite a bit of logic. And to me, it seems like this class will be more valuable if we sidestep these topics. Because if I take this topic at the same rate as I take other, other teachings, you won't get it. So we'd have to take a class or two to really understand Vijnanavada, then we'd have to take a class or two to understand Shankara's arguments here. It would be very, you could get it, I have no doubt. You could understand it all if it's presented properly, but it would, it would take you know, half a dozen classes just to cover this half a dozen verses. <laughs> so for this reason, I think this class will be much more powerful. I, may, I mentioned before this principle of editing. If you, if you have written something, the more you edit, meaning the more you remove, the better it becomes. This is a, almost a universal rule of editing. Because you, re, you remove the fluff, you remove the unnecessary material, what remains is the essence. And so that essence previously was covered up by some of the so-called fluff, by removing the unnecessary material, the essence becomes that much more powerful. So for that reason, <coughs> we're skipping over this section and from time to time. And I'll explain what we're skipping over so you get an idea of, of, of what's going on. And I think I said in the first class, we're, we're seeing roughly half the verses of this chapter. So Shankara dedicates quite a bit of attention to these, these other issues. So that being said, interesting though, when he's done with that, with his refutation of the Buddhists, he comes back and lands almost exactly in the same place. Not quite, we'll, we'll, we'll see that here. It's like he's picking up the thread, so to speak, after used to watch my guru doing that. He was so good. He would love to go on these long detours in his discussions, but he would all, and it could be half an hour, <laughs> he'd be wandering. And of course, it would be valuable. It was not like he's talking about useless stuff. So it would be really valuable spiritual teachings, just not what is present in the current text, but he would always come exactly back to where he left off. He had that skill. Okay, we will pick up the thread here. Verse 17. <coughs> Ajnanam kalpana mulam Ajnanam kalpana mulam Samsarasya niyamakam Samsarasya niyamakam Hitvatmanam param brahma Hitvatmanam param brahma Vindyan mukta Dum sada bhayam, vindyanatam sada bhayam. So far we're talking about identification. What is identification? We've used fancy words before, like superimposition, adhyasa. To, I, to superimpose I-ness, on the physical body is superimposition. That's identification. So we're taking it another, we keep using this word identification. Let's now analyze, what is that identification? What I, how is it that I say I am this body? Well, this is a very profound analysis. In fact, this is the analysis that Shankara gives in his introduction to his Brahma Sutra Bhasha. He says the, f the issue here is we take the I-ness that belongs, when you say I, the essence of that I-ness is the conscious being, right? Your body has no essential I-ness, your mind has no essential I-ness. Essentially that I-ness belongs to consciousness, the conscious being. But what do we do? We take that I-ness that belongs to the conscious being and we superimpose it on the body. I, this is me, and mind, 
this is me. And then conversely, we take attributes of the body, like maleness in this case, and we superimpose the attributes on the body on consciousness. We have two-way superimposition, two-way confusion. We superimpose the I-ness of Atma on the body and mind, and we superimpose the traits of the body and mind on Atma. This is two-way confusion. It is, we call it superimposition in Sanskrit, we use the word adhyasa. So, and this is an important Sanskrit term, you should know its meaning. Adhyasa means superimposition. Now, Shankara's analysis in this verse is to say, why do we do that? <laughs> Where does the superimposition come from? And he makes a very obvious statement, and this is one of the fundamental teachings of Advaita Vedanta, and that is adhyasa, superimposition, is necessarily preceded by ignorance. To put it in terms of body and mind here, due to ignorance of your true self as Satchitananda Atma, therefore you're able to do this two-way superimposition. If you knew your true nature as such an Ananda Atma, you wouldn't fall prey to this superimposition. So what my guru called self non-recognition is the root cause for the superimposition and identification that makes us suffer. And that is, that is what uh, Shankara is describing in this verse. He says, Ajnanam is kalpana mulam. Ignorance is the mulam, the root, the cause for kalpana. Kalpana means what you imagine, what you project, what you superimpose. This is what he is saying here. There's Actually, I want to go to the board. There's something a little technical here I'd like to, to share with you. Um, let me just, let me see, push the right button. Turn this one off. Good, remind me to put this back. Okay. So, the, the metaphor that we, con that we typically use is the rope snake. You all know the story, in a dark alley, you see a coiled up rope, you think it's a snake. That's an example of superimposition, right? You superimpose snake on rope. And you superimpose snake on rope because of ignorance of the rope. If you knew it was a rope, you wouldn't superimpose the snake on it. So this is the teaching. We start with ignorance, and due to ignorance, either ignorance of the rope or ignorance of your true self, as Satchitananda Atma, that results in superimposition. And we're talking about, in particular, identification. <coughs> The Sanskrit words are important here, so make sure they're known. Ajnana is ignorance, which then leads to, starting to write in Sanskrit again, the Ajnana leads to, oops, Adhyasa. This is the sequence. So look, look at what he's saying. Due to ignorance of the rope, you superimpose the snake. And notice, snake makes you afraid. Snake makes you suffer. Interesting. Does not knowing the rope make you suffer? If it's really dark, you don't even see the rope. It's not that ignorance of the rope makes you suffer. Who does this? You do. You, you superimpose 
the snake on the rope, you create your own suffering. This is Vedanta, once again. So now to apply it here. Due to ajnana, the so-called veil of ignorance that prevents you from recognizing your true nature, due to that particular ignorance, we superimpose the attributes of the body and mind on consciousness. We superimpose the I-ness, which belongs on consciousness to the body and mind, and that causes suffering. So this is the, uh, the essence of the problem here, which is what Shankara is discussing here. Let me get back here. Uh, this one and this one, good. <coughs> All right. So this is what uh, Shankara is describing in the first half of this verse. He says, Ajnanam, ignorance, is kalpana mulam, is the root cause for projection, the root cause for superimposition. Also, it is niyamakam, that which causes samsara, that which causes worldly suffering. Ignorance is the root cause. And here, we're not talking about ignorance of a rope. <laughs> ignorance of your true nature as sat chirananda is a root cause for projection and the root cause for suffering. If you didn't project, you wouldn't suffer. In fact, well, hold off on that. We'll see that in the next verse. So, yeah, good. So, uh, uh, second half, hitwa, having removed that ignorance, Vindyat, one discovers param, one discovers atmanam, one's true self, as param brahma, absolute reality. Muktam, liberated. Sada abhayam, always free from fear. There's something that might not be apparent to you here. Notice hitva, having removed. What is to be removed? Should we remove and you, you, when I say this, you're likely to make a mistake, so you don't, have to, <laughs> you don't have to say. Should we remove the identification or should we remove ignorance? If you had a choice of two, <laughs> A or B choice, which should be removed? Should, is it better to remove the identification with the body and mind? Or is it better to remove the ignorance? Some of you have figured it out correctly. And that is, Shankar has already said, Ajnanam Kalpana Mulam. The root cause is ignorance. And let's, let's make that really clear. Um, suppose you remove the identification, the superimposition. In fact, you do that every night in deep sleep. I'm uh, stealing from the next verse. We'll see the Shankara teaches us in the next verse. In deep sleep, do you have any identification? No. Do you have any suffering? That's interesting. They go together, right? That's what we just discussed. Identification and suffering are, they come, it's a package deal, as they say. They come together. So in deep sleep, you are free from identification. So, great, except you wake up <laughs> and the identification comes back because the root cause has not been addressed. It's like many people have uh, frustration with medical problems. They go to a doctor. If the doctor only treats the symptoms and doesn't treat the underlying illness, then the the fundamental illness never gets treated. So we would, this is a, a nice metaphor. The root cause here is like the illness. The superimposition is like symptoms. If you had an illness with no symptoms, would you, any problem? In, in fact, in a way, consider, how about this? We have a microbiologist sitting, sitting here, and she would tell you 
that in your gut and in other parts of your body are gazillions of bacteria. Oh, man. <laughs> and yet, here we are. <laughs> we, we seem to be okay. So, in spite of those bacteria, they create no symptoms. I won't, they're not, technically they're not illness, but you see the metaphor. If you had an illness and no symptoms, it wouldn't be a problem. But that's not what happens. What happens is you have the illness, you have symptoms, doctor treats the symptoms and doesn't <laughs> treat the illness. And this leads to our frustration. So here, Shankara says that when you address the root cause, ajnanam, that ignorance which is kalpana, Mulam, the root cause for projection, root cause for superimposition, root cause for identification. When you recognize your true nature as Satchitananda Atma, the problem is over. You've addressed the root cause of the problem of identification. When you know you are Satchitananda Atma, and you know that as, as vividly as you know that you are the person sitting in your chair. Right now, you know you're the person sitting in your chair. When you know that you are Satchitananda Atma with the same vividness as what you experience right now sitting in your chair, you'll find that identification is impossible. It goes away. We said before, it takes time. Yes, it takes time, but it goes away. All right? And in the absence, you discover your true self, Atmanam, as Param Brahma, that's that fundamental reality, unchanging, which is Sada Muktam, eternally free, never got into a state of bondage. Bondage is due to ignorance in the mind. Atma never got into bondage. And that Atma also, Sada Abhayam, is nothing can threaten that that Satchitananda Atma. Good. Let's see one more verse. <clears throat> Jagrat Swapnau Tayor Bijam. Jagrat Swapnau Tayor Bijam. Sushupta Kyam Tamo Mayam. Sushupta Kyam Tamo Mayam. Anyonyas Minasatwacha. Anyonyas minasatvacha nasti tye tatrayam tyajet nasti tye tatrayam tyajet. Here Shankara is using the three states of waking, dream, and sleep to help us understand this issue of uh, ignorance leading to superimposition identification to understand it better. So he says, Jagrat Swapnau, in the waking and dream states, Tayoho Bijam, the root, Bijam literally seed, the, the cause, the seed or cause, Tayoho, for those two, for the waking state and deep sleep state is Sushupta, Akyam. It is that which is called sushupti, deep sleep, which is tamo mayam, tamas, made of tamas. Now, this is this reference may seem out of place, so it takes a, just a little bit of explanation. I mentioned it before, actually, and that is, in deep sleep, deep sleep is often called a state of pure ignorance. Deep sleep, that's a good way of describing it. A state of pure tamas, a state of pure ignorance. And what's significant about it is in that state of pure ignorance, as we said, there is no superimposition. Because <laughs> you're not awake. <laughs> so in that state, you know, superimposition and suffering only takes place when you're awake. It's so significant 
um, that in deep sleep you don't suffer. Everyone, by the way, everyone says ignorance is bliss. Doesn't that apply here? Ignorance is bliss. That state of complete, perfect ignorance is truly a state of bliss. You can't argue that. The problem is you wake up, which is not really a problem, <laughs> but you get my point. When you wake up, the problem kicks in, so to speak. By the way, dream could be considered you wake up halfway. <laughs> so if you wake up halfway, or if you wake up all the way, by the way, there's some neuroscience behind that. You don't go from waking state into dream. You go from waking state to dream, deep sleep, and then you wake up halfway. That's actually what neuroscience teaches. So, um, that, and Shankara's got it right here, where he says that deep sleep is the root cause for the states of waking and dream. So if you wake up halfway into a dream, you identify with your dream body, do you not? So when that elephant is chasing you in a dream, you're afraid because you're identified with your dream body. And if you wake up all the way, then you're threatened by other things, whatever it might be, not elephants, but <laughs> more, more uh, abstract things. You're threatened by the stock market or, so <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> anyway, the point is, when you are awake, you have identification, superimposition, and therefore you suffer in deep sleep. That ignorance is still present, but you don't suffer because temporarily the superimposition has ceased. As soon as you wake up or wake up halfway, that superimposition kicks in, so to speak, as I said before. So now Shankara concludes in the third line, third line, therefore anyonyasmen asatvacha na asti iti trayam tyajet. He says, he makes an observation about all three of these conditions. I'm trying to think. Um, Shankara is doing something you're not supposed to do. It's called a mixed metaphor, and I don't want to analyze this to death because it just won't, won't be very helpful. But he's, he's actually using the three states as a metaphor, but then he's mixing it with the truth, <laughs> the, the true teachings of Advaita Vedanta on the three states. And according to Advaita Vedanta, anything that changes is not real. Our definition of real is that which doesn't change. The snake comes and goes, it's not real. The uh, waking state comes and goes, not real. Dream state comes and goes, not real. Deep sleep state comes and goes, none of them are real. So therefore Shankar con concludes, Trayam Tyajet. <laughs> You should reject all of them because anyonyas men asatvat, because they are asatvat, they don't exist, anyonyas men, um, inclusively. In, in other words, they don't exist at the same time. In English, we say they are mutually exclusive. Only one of those states exist at a time, so therefore they're constantly coming and going. Anything that comes and goes is not absolutely real. Therefore, na asti iti, etat, therefore etat trayam, all these three are, um, they are unreal and trayam tyajet. You should reject them all. The reason this is a mixed metaphor, okay, let, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me not do that. And why should I criticize Shankaracharya anyway? That's not fair. That's not. Who am I to, <laughs> you know, it's, but let, let's be very clear. It's a literary problem. It's not a problem with the teaching. <laughs> so it's just a stylistic thing. You've heard a teacher say, don't use mixed metaphors. So this is, anyway. I think there, there is a tradition here, whatever your grammar teacher said you shouldn't do, 
That's, a, that's what's always done. If your grammar teacher told you never use double negatives, Sanskrit loves double, <laughs> double negatives. Okay, um, this is actually a good place to uh, stop. We'll continue with this uh, teaching in our next class. <coughs> Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashyadduhka Bhagbavet Asato Ma Sadkamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotirgamaya Mrityor Ma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tat Sat Good. All right.